The Salish Sea is one of the world's most amazing ecosystems, overflowing with life, and it's the best place on earth to be a wildlife veterinarian. Join me, Joe Gatos, and Team Sea Doc as we explore the natural wonders of the Pacific Northwest in Salish Sea Wild. Born high in the Canadian Cascade Mountains, the Skagit River flows south across the border and runs 150 miles before spilling into the sea. It's the only river in Washington's half of the Salish Sea that produces all five species of native Pacific salmon. It also produces 60% of the wild Chinook. Which makes the scenic Skagit the most important watershed on the American side of the Salish Sea for supplying fish to feed our endangered southern resident killer whales. In the Cascades' western foothills, cold, clear water rushes down mountain streams to join the Skagit. The river bottom and creek beds are covered in smooth, colorful rocks and gravel, its ideal spawning habitat. And near the tiny town of Marble Mount, Washington, the watershed appears pristine. Upstream, however, three dams disrupt the Skagit's flow. Downstream, the rivers channel through urban areas, diked by farms, and polluted by stormwater runoff. At hundreds of places in the watershed, roadways obstruct fish trying to access side streams and tributaries to spawn. All of this human activity over the last 150 years has affected the Skagit's ability to welcome its returning salmon and to support their young. Fortunately, several organizations, tribes, and agencies are working to restore the river and improve its salmon runs. Allison Studley is the executive director of the Skagit Fisheries Enhancement Group, the first nonprofit to begin rebuilding fish habitat oh, yeah, in the River Valley. Yeah, she yeah. takes me on a hike to check out one of their side channel restoration sites. You're right. Humans have had a significant impact on the habitat in the Skagit River Valley. And the Skagit Fisheries Enhancement Group is working with local landowners, both private and public, to help them restore habitat on their property. We are planting tons of trees with volunteers. We are reconnecting habitat by replacing culverts and building bridges. And we're restoring side channel habitat like this um, in order to uh, recreate habitat for juvenile fish and adult fish. Um, and we're also just working with our community to educate and engage and make sure they understand the impacts that they can have on being better stewards um, of our environment into the future. After visiting with Allison, we meet up with our old friend Pete Naylor, who lives in the Skagit Valley and offered to help us scout the river by raft. As soon as we push off, there is no doubt which way this peat-powered boat is headed. It's impossible to paddle against the current. About five miles an hour. So how amazing is it to know that any spawning salmon we find around here have already fought this relentless flow for more than 70 miles? On board the raft, the crew thinks my yellow dry suit is also pretty amazing. I don't know if you're a Power Ranger or a Power Banana. Power <laughs> Banana! <laughs> These bald eagles have probably never seen a giant banana with binoculars, so they're curious. The eagles flock to the Skagit to feast on spawned out coho and chum salmon. In years with healthy fish runs, Hundreds of these majestic raptors will roost along the river. The Skagit is running clear. However, it's still tough for us to spot fish from the boat. We can't get a bird's eye view like the eagles, but maybe we can get the fish eye view. With the current running so strong, it would be dangerous to try and snorkel in the river itself. We might get swept all the way back to the Salish Sea. We look for a safer spot. While the big Chinook are spawning in the main channel of the Skagit River, we've moved into one of the smaller tributaries, prime spawning ground for one of the most beautiful salmon, the coho. Ah. 
The water is a frigid 40 degrees Fahrenheit, but it's worth a little chill for the chance to witness one of nature's most remarkable rituals. Coho prefer to spawn in shallower, slower moving water than their big cousins, the Chinook. Much of this creek is only knee deep. To make sure we don't disturb any nesting sites, we leave our dive fins in the truck. Instead of swimming or wading, we float above the bottom and pick our way upstream using only carefully placed fingers. We're joined on the creek by an American Dipper, the only aquatic songbird in North America. Just like the salmon, dippers need clear, rocky streams with good flow, and they're very sensitive to water quality. Oh, yeah. Dippers get their name from the funky little bop they do as a form of communication and display. Or maybe they just like to dance. Special adaptations similar to seabirds allow dippers to swim and survive in this cold water. Oily, insulating feathers, dense bones, waterproof nostrils, and strong wing muscles enable them to fly underwater and hunt for aquatic insects, small fish, and fish eggs. This dipper picked the perfect creek for his territory because it's so popular with coho. The spawning salmon supply nutrients that nurture insect populations. The fish also provide a yearly feast of high protein eggs that help the dippers, which don't migrate south, survive the cold winter. We crawl further upstream and begin to see fishy shapes in the watery mist. Up ahead, there's a whole school of coho. These fish have not eaten since they left the Salish Sea and began swimming up the Skagit, so it's important that they conserve their strength for spawning. That's why they've gathered where the roots of an overhanging tree slow the current. The salmon are very focused on each other, reading cues, jockeying for position, and checking out potential mates. They don't see us as a threat, so we discreetly join the school to get a closer look. Coho are also known as silver salmon, which is their primary color during their years at sea. Now, as they return to freshwater as mature three-year-olds, they shift into their spawning apparel of green and red. The females wear muted colors, while the males sport startling shades from crimson to deep burgundy. A color change is just the beginning for the males. In preparation for mating, their heads deform dramatically with their snouts and jaws contorting into what are called kipes, hooked weapons bristling with sharp teeth. The boys brandish these nasty new snouts and chase and sometimes even bite rivals as they compete for access to mates. Females skip the full werewolf transformation. They do change color, but if the spawn is to be successful, it's critical for them to dedicate most of their energy reserves to egg production and to building and defending their nests. Each coho mama in the school is carrying 2,000 or more eggs, and she must infuse every one of those little orange orbs with enough nutrients to sustain a baby salmon for about two months. All fish expend energy to breed, but our Pacific salmon are exceptional. Their entire lives are an Ironman competition. Born in freshwater, they need to alter their physiology including the function of their gills and kidneys before moving into saltwater, a move that would kill almost every other kind of fish. After feeding and growing at sea for years, about two years for coho and five or so for Chinook, the salmon navigate back to the mouth of their birth river. Once again, they must undergo a major biological transformation so they can survive in fresh water. Only then do they start fighting the current to get all the way back upriver to the same area where they were born. These coho swim more than 70 miles up the Skagit, but the long distance champions of Pacific salmon are the Chinook born in the Yukon River, who swim 2,000 miles upstream to spawn. The coho are getting feisty. Males start challenging each other and cozying up to females. The school breaks apart 
and things start to get serious. This female has chosen a spot for her nest called a red. Red sites are a Goldilocks situation. The gravel has to be small enough for her to dig, but it can't be too small or it'll prevent dissolved oxygen from reaching the buried eggs. Everything must be just right. The female flips onto her side and digs the nest with her powerful tail. The dominant male rushes up and rubs against her, signaling that he's ready and willing to fertilize eggs. But she's not quite happy with the nest yet, so the male goes back to chasing away his competitors. He won't go far though, because as soon as the female releases her eggs, he only has about 15 seconds to shower them with milt. After that short window closes, there is no chance for sperm to enter and fertilize the eggs. Everything about the salmon way of life seems improbable. They're born in these four streams that may look lush and productive, but can't possibly support fish that grow to be eight to 10 pounds, like these coho, or more than 60 pounds, like Chinook. So to get enough food to grow big, the salmon must go to sea. To reproduce, they must return to their mother stream. To do so, they've evolved a strategy that requires epic feats of navigation and endurance and ends with the frantic finale of spawning. The journey back home is so taxing that both the male and female Pacific salmon die after they spawn a single time. It's a one-shot, big bang theory of breeding. But this lifestyle of packing on calories, vitamins, and minerals at sea and ferrying them all the way back to fresh water has its benefits, both for the salmon and for our rivers and forests. Check this out. Some people might just think that this is a dead fish, but it's not. This salmon has fulfilled its reproductive imperative, but that's not the end of the story. It's now a perfect package of nutrients that were collected far off in the Pacific Ocean and delivered 50 miles up this river by this remarkable fish. And those oceanic nutrients are now gonna feed bacteria, bugs, birds, bears, and even ancient trees. While this male coho with his intimidating kite fertilizes the forest and the stream, down in the gravel, little eyes appear. The next generation. After about six weeks, the eggs will hatch and become alvin, which are baby salmon with bloopy bellies. The belly is a yolk sac, and the alvin will stay in the gravel until it uses up all the sac's nutrients. Then it'll wriggle free into the stream as a little fry and begin the salmon cycle all over again. For thousands of years, our river supported more than enough salmon to feed the sharks, sea lions, killer whales, humans, eagles, and bears with plenty left over to spawn and keep the fish populations healthy. Healthy salmon runs mean healthy forests. Trees grow three times faster if they live along a salmon spawning stream because of the natural nitrogen and phosphorus fertilizer gifted to them by the bodies of spawned out fish. In turn, the tree is cool, purify, and feed the stream while providing shelter for baby salmon. Now, however, our wild salmon runs, especially the critically important Chinook, are in big trouble. These magnificent fish, the most fascinating, valuable, and iconic fish in the Northwest, are endangered by such things as habitat loss, dams, pollution, and the myriad effects of a rapidly changing climate. Fortunately, we have the power to undo much of the damage. We've already done a lot to try and recover our Northwest salmon, but we need to do so much more to ensure that there will always be enough fish for the force, for us, and for the Southern resident killer whales. 
To find out what you can do to help restore our salmon and save the killer whales, go to SeaDocSociety.org forward slash salmon.